Even though the maximum elevation difference on the tour trail is only about 150 feet, we pass through three distinct forest zones on our route. The first zone we see at the entrance trail is a mixed mesophytic forest typical of northeast Ohio. Common species include American beech, sugar maple, white oak, red oak, cucumber magnolia, and sassafras. As we move up the slope toward the Sharon outcrop, the dark green of eastern hemlocks begins to fill the canopy over our heads, marking the beginning of the hemlock hardwood zone. Finally, at the summit, we find the unusual white pine, northern hardwood, hemlock zone, which is pictured here. Located at the southwestern limit of this forest type, it is quite rare in Ohio. It is never easy to photograph individual trees in a forest, so our emphasis here will be on bark texture that is visible at eye level from the trail. The light and dark vertical banding, sometimes called ski runs, is an excellent field mark for northern red oak. These trees can grow to 165 feet tall and live for 500 years. Widely cultivated as a landscape and shade tree from Georgia to Ontario, this handsome species of oak transplants readily, grows rapidly for an oak, and tolerates urban environmental conditions. The wood has a reddish tint and makes attractive indoor flooring, interior architectural trim, and household furniture. Its only limitation is an open grain making it subject to moisture infiltration and rotting when used in outdoor applications. The yellowish bronze bark of yellow birch peeling into narrow curls is unmistakable. At Little Mountain, yellow birches are concentrated on or near the rocky outcrops at the summit, often with exposed roots clinging to the cliffs and draped over boulders. The water-permeated Sharon conglomerate makes a perfect substrate for these moisture-loving trees. They range throughout the Great Lakes region, southeast Canada, and the Appalachians. Although slow-growing, this is the largest species of birch in North America, reaching heights of 100 feet. Bruised twigs have a root beer or wintergreen odor, and the highly resinous barks makes excellent tinder for starting a fire. It will ignite even when wet. Yellow birch is a pioneer species that can quickly colonize disturbed areas. Birds love the seeds, and several species of butterfly caterpillars depend on its leaves, and early settlers made tea from the leaves. Some of the towering eastern hemlocks at Little Mountain may exceed 300 years old. This is a tree of cool, rainy, humid climates of the North American east and higher elevations of the Appalachians. Its preferred habitats include sheltered, north-facing sides of steep ravines, north-facing hillsides, and rocky hilltops. Ranging from northern Alabama to Quebec, it can grow over 170 feet tall. One specimen was documented to be 554 years old. Although white pines can exceed eastern hemlocks in height, in terms of trunk volume, eastern hemlock is the largest native evergreen tree in the eastern United States. It plays a vital role in the forest ecosystem, especially for birds. Some of Ohio's rarest breeding birds are conifer nesting species. Blackburnian warblers, winter wrens, black-throated blue warblers, and blue-headed vireos would probably not be around if it weren't for these magnificent trees. This beautiful specimen of a mature tupelo was photographed next to the summit trail at Little Mountain. Its most distinctive feature is the deeply furrowed bark vaguely resembling alligator hide, or dinosaur skin according to young students who visit here. It goes by various names, tupelo, black gum, sour gum, pepperidge. It can reach 140 feet in height and is one of the first trees to show color in fall. Its thick, shiny, dark green leaves turn to brilliant colors that vary from yellow to orange to red to burgundy. Ecologically, it is an important tree for wildlife. The small black fruits of female trees ripen in the fall are an, and are an important food source for both migratory and non-migratory bird life. This photo shows a survivor of the dwindling population of eastern white pines on the summit of Little Mountain. Billions of these trees once covered great tracts of eastern North America, some reaching heights of 230 feet, but 99% of the virgin giants had already been logged by 1800. White pine is important in secondary succession. The big pines on Little Mountain are all roughly the same age, between 210 and 230 years old. 
Some event over 200 years ago, perhaps a forest fire or a severe windstorm, opened the hilltop forest enough for sunlight to reach the ground, allowing these sun-loving trees to sprout. The result is one of the few Ohio examples of an eastern white pine, eastern hemlock mixed hardwood forest, more characteristic of upstate New York or New England than here. Probably dating from the late 1800s or early 1900s, this photo is from the archives of the Lake County Historical Society and is used with their kind permission. It shows a more extensive pine forest on the summit than the one that survives today. The old growth stand on Little Mountain is senescing, having battled acid rain, pollution, drought, blizzards, and the infertile soils for more than two centuries. To maintain the biodiversity of this unusual tract of forest for the future, Holden staff members have planted eastern white pine seedlings in small clearings, enclosing them in deer fencing to guard against hungry whitetails with a taste for pine needles. This photo shows the deeply furrowed bark, dark gray and beautifully tinged with reddish purple on a mature eastern white pine at Little Mountain. Few Americans today are aware of the profound importance of this tree in American history. Along with tobacco, cotton, gold, silver, and furs, especially beaver pelts, white pine lumber was one of the exports that put North America on the map. It was our first colonial and then national symbol preceding the bald eagle and Liberty Bell by 100 years. The flags that flew from the sterns of George Washington's naval vessels during the first days of the American Revolution depicted eastern white pines, not the familiar Betsy Ross flag with its 13 stars. What made this tree so important was its strong, light, rot-resistant, and flexible lumber, a strategic war material in the days of three-masted sailing ships. It was prized for making tall masts thanks to its great height, straightness, and ability to bend almost double without breaking in the storms. This white pine cone was photographed on the trail at Little Mountain. Note the short hook stalk at the base, an identifying field mark. The cones are slender, about five or six inches long, and often dotted with sap. Eastern white pine is known by a variety of names, including white pine, northern white pine, soft pine, and Weymouth pine in England. It is the tallest and historically the most important conifer of eastern North America. Ranging from Georgia to Newfoundland, it is the official state tree of Maine, which is known as the pine tree state, and of Michigan. It is also the provincial tree of Ontario. White pine needles grow in bundles of five, in contrast to other pines commonly found in Ohio. Scotch pine, Virginia pine, Austrian pine, red pine, and shortleaf pine have two needles per bundle, and pitch pine has three needles per bundle. Eastern white pine is still prized as one of America's best lumber trees and as a popular residential and municipal landscape tree. Its seeds are an important food source for birds and mammals. Deer love to browse on any needles they can reach. Native Americans made flour out of the inner bark. Early settlers made tea out of the needles which contained five times as much vitamin C as a lemon. Its ability to hold its needles long after being cut made it popular as a Christmas tree. At first glance, a wet rotting log isn't very appealing or photogenic. We tend to pay more attention to living trees than dead ones. But the old log pictured here retains as much importance to the forest ecosystem as it did when it was still standing as part of a living tree. A forest isn't just a one-time collection of tall plants. It is a living cycle. The cycle is fueled by sun, water, and by decomposition, which is the breakdown of complex organic compounds that were once part of a living and now dead plants into simpler forms of matter that can be used by the next generation of plants. This photo and the ones that follow all illustrate the recycling process at Little Mountain. Scientists and foresters often make a distinction between a den tree and a snag. A den tree is a living tree with a cavity in its trunk or a limb that can be used by wildlife for cover, whereas a snag is a still-standing dead tree that offers shelter and food for wildlife. The tree pictured here is a snag. In the past, lumbermen were diligent about clearing snags and dead logs from their forest lands. Rotting trees were viewed as fire hazards and havens for harmful insects. Today's forest professionals know better, but many woodlot owners do not. 
They routinely clear all dead materials as unsightly or dangerous, not realizing that up to a third of wildlife species depends on den trees, snags, or deadfall for food and shelter. Rotting trees are part of the cycle of restoring nutrients to the soil. Rotting leaf litter is another vital part of nutrient cycling. In this late fall view along the exit trail, note the tupelo leaves still showing brilliant reds long after falling from the tree. The breakdown of leaf litter starts with the loss of water and carbon. It continues with the physical fragmentation of the leaves into smaller bits and pieces, further increasing surface area available for microbial colonization and attack. Other agents working to return nutrients to the soil are invertebrate fauna, fungi, earthworms, and insects. Of the many minerals and compounds returned by decomposition, the two most important are nitrogen and phosphorus. After these nutrients have re-entered the soil, trees and plants can reabsorb them through their roots, continuing the cycle indefinitely. Nurse logs are essential components of forest equilibrium, slowly returning elements such as carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, potassium, and phosphorus to the soil for use by living and yet to sprout plants. An important step in the rotting process is the breakdown of lignin, the durable organic compound that gives woody plants their stiffness and strength. The upper surface of a rotting log is actually a good place for a tree seedling to sprout. As the seedlings grow, the decaying log provides moisture, nutrients, mycorrhizae, which is a beneficial fungi, and a protected elevation above forest floor pathogens. As the log continues to rot away, the roots of the seedling grow downward on either side until they reach the underlying soil. Within a decade or two in humid conditions, the log completely decomposes and disappears, making the tree that sprouted on it look like it grew on stilts. 